Seth Curry and Andre Drummond debut for the Brooklyn Nets and help snap that 11-game losing streak. It's all coming up right after the theme music. You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Locked On Nets podcast on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day. Over there, you'll find Doug Norrie, owner-operator, DFSR, for all your daily fantasy sports rankings. DraftKings, FanDuel, he's got you covered. I'm Adam Marbrecht, breaking it down for the New York Football Giants on the One Giant Podcast with my boy, Andy Mack. We thank you for making us your first listen of the day, free on all those great platforms. Going to talk about Seth Curry. Going to talk about Andre Drummond, the impact on this roster. But first and foremost, Doug, the streak, the 11-game losing streak mercifully comes to the end for Brooklyn. Yeah, didn't feel like it was going to happen. Um, it was starting to feel Hard like time. this was going to be the rest of the season. It's hard to get yourself <laughs> out of the mire when you're standing in it. Um, yeah, they hadn't won since January 21st. It was looking like it was going to continue to be tough. You know, no more James Harden. Kyrie Irving can't play the home game still. Obviously, no Kevin Durant. But as we're going to talk about, reinforcements finally here in Brooklyn in the form of like real NBA basketball players. And it's not a knock on the rest of the roster. It's just that the way the roster was constructed, that you know, they just didn't have they just didn't have the horses in a lot of these games like they didn't have enough shooting. They sometimes didn't have enough size. Some of that was almost instantly cured <laughs> in this trade on mm -hmm. just the role players that came in, frankly, like the guys that weren't even the um, like weren't even the core pieces of the trade, even though it right. looks like Mark's really held out for, for Curry um, in it. And this is what you get. And I mean, I for one, once they got up a little bit early, I was like, I just I needed them to win this game bad. <laughs> like I just was not going to be able to suffer another one. And it's good to just hey start one in the in the W column here and, and restart a new streak hopefully. Yeah, and listen, it comes a game delayed, right? They weren't able to get them out on the court over the weekend, obviously. But when you think about making a trade like this, we all know, right? They trade James Harden, one of the best talents in the league, to a competitor in the same conference. There still is this this question mark around. Is this good for right now? Is it good for opening up a bigger window? And just getting to your point, two veteran players with a clear, like they were playing important minutes on yep. the Philadelphia 76ers. So when they step in, there is this immediacy of, okay, it elevates, it elevates everyone's game. And I think that just inside of that trade, the question mark was, is it enough? And we have, we're not going to see Ben Simmons just yet. We'll find out what his timeline looks like. He was there in shoot around. He was taking a couple shots there. So it looks like he's at least just ramping himself up. But the, that, that question mark is what loomed over top of this. And one game against the Kings does not make a championship team. And no. yet it, it certainly felt like, okay, this can work. Like this can work and this can work very quickly for the Brooklyn Nets. And the thing, what look, the, no one's going to look at this game and say, okay, this is a championship level team right now. The key here mm -hmm. was just like looking in the short term and saying, hey, they just can't keep losing. Right. Like 11 games in a row is totally ridiculous. Um, it was came close against Miami on Saturday and they kind of, you know, just weren't able to get it out in the end, even though the, uh, Kyrie was really cooking. I know we didn't do a podcast yesterday because of the Super Bowl, but, um, you know, losing that one, losing a couple other close ones, it was just starting to feel like you're a little snake bit. And I felt like in this game, and again, we're going to talk specifically about Curry and Drummond here in a second for sure. But the I did feel like in this game, you could you could definitely tell a renewed energy for the team, right? It's like this is a group that still doesn't have Kyrie. There's no KD. Like this is still kind of role player central around the Nets. Mm -hmm. um, and yet there was like an energy probably based on just having a few more bodies you know, seeing a little bit of size with Drummond, knowing that you're getting professional shooting um, and just like a guy who's really improved his game in Seth Curry and starting to feel like, hey, we can actually, we can win this game against what's mostly in the way they want to construct it, a full strength Kings team. that's different than the Kings team that the Nets lost to a, a couple of weeks ago, the traded Halliburton for Sabonis. Like, sure. so I think that's the key. It's like, I felt like a lot you know, sometimes when you watch this, maybe even if you turn on the fan part of your brain a little bit more, you think, oh, these balls are not going our way. The little calls aren't going our way or like the 50 50 balls. I feel like the Nets have lost an inordinate amount of 50 50 balls this year. And I felt like that kind of didn't happen this game. Like they, a lot of the bounces kind of did go their way <laughs> right. in this one. And maybe sometimes that's just what you need to start feeling 
like you're, you know, moving downhill a little bit more rather than pushing the stone uphill, which is feel what they felt like been doing. I just felt like they, this game had a sense of that. And I, I just think it's an energy thing, but just some new faces, a new lease on life for the team. I'm not saying it's because James Harden's gone. I just think they just look at this as like sort of a new thing now. Yeah, yeah, and you know what? I was going to touch on just the idea. You know, the Blake Griffin comments that come out after the trade saying, we want guys that want to be here, want to be a part of sure. this. Kevin Durant all but said the sim similar kind of thing. And if, if you read the, the in between the lines of what felt like what was going on kind of behind the scenes for a while inside the locker room, then there's no way that it can't be draining on on especially role players. Like we talked about it before, you know, Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant, they're going to step out there. Their game is going to be basically foolproof regardless of the circumstances in and around the team. But role players, it's it's a lot trickier for them. I think because you're, you're being asked to do more, whether it's Patty Mills, step up and play a much higher level for a much longer amount of minutes on a game-to-game -game basis, or all of these rookies that you're saying, go out there and give it everything you got. Now, by the way, if you struggle early, we're not going to dog you. If you start to have success, though, expectations are going to rise. And now a guy like Kessler Edwards, who's hitting a bit of a lull for himself, all of a sudden it's, yeah, okay, work through that, as opposed to there's a bit of a necessity here. And that just seems to have been what the sense was prior to this trade happening. And then to your point, it's 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 not a one-to-one -one because now Harden is gone, but there is this breath of fresh air, and as weird as it sounds, saying, okay, even the Miami game included, and it feels different now because you finally get two of these pieces on the court tonight, but the, our season, quote-unquote, starts now. That's all, that's all that we can treat this as because it's hard to lose 11 games in a row beyond that streak, everything that's gone on, and say, no, no, this is all part of the same journey. No, we start here. We try to be strong until Kevin Durant comes back, and then we really start to surge here over what'll be a 25-30 game stretch ahead of the playoffs. And it feels a little fitting that it was against the Kings because the Kings game will go down as Harden's last game, right? Like, that was the last time he played for the Brooklyn Nets. He was absolutely horrible. Now, whether mm -hmm. he was really hurt in that game or not, he's still hurt now. So you, you want us to just drum it up to injury? Fine, we'll do that. It's no big deal. He's not on the team anymore. We don't need to, like, you know, continue to probably uh, relitigate what happened here. But... It is interesting that that was his last game. It was probably the defining piece of why it made it started making it easier for the Nets to get rid of him because he was so mm -hmm. bad. It looked like he dogged it. Um, that was it. Just seemed like the beginning of the end. Like, and then that's really when stuff really started to spiral around uh, around the, the rumors, and that's when it started to ramp up. Was kind of after that game. So it's so funny that like if you're looking for like sort of the rebirth of the team, that it comes a couple weeks later here. Um, against the same against the Kings again, different look Kings team, but against the Kings, it's the new players on the team that sort of rejuvenate them. You get another, you get the the, the game of the, his life, which we'll talk about from Bruce Brown. Uh, and so you just you just have all these kind of pieces fall into place. And I don't know if you want to just like write a little story about it, like the Kings piece, I find to be at least moderately interesting around that, right? Because I because I, I do think that's the game, right? When we when we think about the end, like the lasting image of James Harden. Uh, Maybe it shouldn't be, but the lasting image for James Harden will be the game that he looked like he never really stepped onto the court. Like it was just, yeah. he was horrible on both ends of the ball and it spelled the beginning of the end. And then they finally break the streak against the same team. Yeah, no, I think you're right. It is a little bit of to whatever that narrative was. Those are the bookends now against the same team and, and a totally different energy, not James Harden aside of, of the team, of all these role players of guys just looking like they're ready to engage in this. So I certainly think that, this feels like the new chapter for the Brooklyn Nets. There is there is a component of, you know, as we get inside this game specifically, Nash ran very deep with his rotation, and I think that that made all the sense in the world because you're really trying to feel your way through how do all these pieces uh, fit together here. As we get into their specific games with Curry and with Drummond, it's yep. obviously an added benefit that these two guys come over from the same team. So when you put them out there on the court into the starting lineup, you also know they have a sense of continuity with one another that you're going to be able to rely on. And I think that that was a bit of a thread throughout this game. These guys could work off one another, knew where each other was going to be on the court. And there were... Listen, there were ebbs and flows, and I think we we saw this uh, with Kevin Durant when he played with the rookies. We saw this when Harden played by himself, when Kyrie played by himself. The energy level in that first quarter for the Brooklyn Nets was really the wave that, that kicked this whole thing off. It, 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 it lulled <laughs> as we got towards halftime and a little bit in the second half, but that was a big surge there as well. It, it just, again... Won't, won't won't knock knock a dead horse here, but it did feel like everyone was ready to be up for this game, and and in a pleasant way compared to my the Miami game, which I thought they did a great job fighting back in. But this was a game where they thought 
not only can we fight in this game, we can actually go out and dominate a team like this in the Kings in spite of all their moving parts, which just as a footnote, seemingly is may or may not be any more effective for them to try to secure that playing spot that they're so desperate for. It's an odd, right. it, was odd, it was odd on both sides in a lot of ways. <laughs> All right, we're going to talk about the Curry piece and Drummond piece. There's a lot to get into there. We'll talk a little more Bruce Brown as well. First, football season might be over for this year, but basketball season is in full steam, both pro and college hoops. We got the uh, college hoops really starting to dial it up. You got to head on over to Bet Online for all the latest odds, totals, player performance props. Uh, where the next fire coach is going to land. Oh, boy. BetOnline.net is the number one spot for all of your sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season and beyond. Not just basketball. BetOnline.net they got you covered for hockey, boxing, UFC. You want the fight nights over there. Uh, and odds right to the Olympic coverage and information that you need for what's happening uh, in those Winter Olympics. Head on over to the website right now, BetOnline.net today. Use your mobile device and you learn about the trends and action that they've got going over there. Bet online where the game starts. And, of course, you make us your first listen of the day. Make Locked On now your second listen, breaking down nightly recaps of all the games around the league. You want to hear about the Knicks getting beaten by the Oklahoma City Thunder? You can check out a little bit of noise around that. And, of course, a wrap-up of a game that we can't quite see the tea leaves on just yet, Chicago and San Antonio. It's a lot of fun. you got to get involved in it because it gives you a nice breath of what's going on around the league. All right, let's turn our attention then to specifically these performances from the two new additions in Seth Curry and Andre Drummond. I said it over on Twitter. I feel perfectly fine cementing this statement now. Seth Curry is officially the third best scorer, third best ball handler, third best shot creator, and third best facilitator on this team. And then this isn't like, oh no, we've we've shockingly uncovered a diamond in the rough. Like Curry has a very clear skill set. He's developed it over the last handful of years, I think, and gotten himself beyond just being a spot spot of three-point shooter, you can argue it's a it's a combination of, of need to this roster. But the way that he performed in this game right out of the gates, I, I think really set a very clear tempo and expectation for what he can bring to this roster in the short term. Yeah, they need this. They really needed it. And he, look, he's not James Harden. No one's asked him to be. He was obviously not the focal point in this trade. But when you saw that the Nets got him, it really started to feel like the trade was going to be at least a little more balanced in terms of, you know, Simmons is going to be what he is, but they get back this other kind of player that they've really needed. And they've really, it's really the second they lost Joe Harris, we've seen it basically on the day that happened that they have lacked the floor spacing and they've lacked like, just like the consistent three point shooting from enough guys. Yes. Patty Mills has been good. Yes. Obviously they get the performances out of Kyrie and KD uh, that they've gotten, but they've been a shooter short at least in a lot of games. So when you see Curry come back in that trade, you start to already uh, immediately feel better about the spacing. And then what this game reminds you of, because they don't have Kyrie and KD and they need a little more offensive facilitation, you see that he has actually become like he came into the league um, and he's like really a crazy story because he was like in the G league and he was like, not really a heralded guy, even though he was Steph's brother. And he was just like a spot up three point shooter, but he's actually made himself into more of a three level score. Like he took 18 yep. shots in this game. Only eight were from three. He got into the mid range a bunch and he's just a steady hand in an offense that really, really needed like this kind of guy, because we've seen, especially without Kyrie, like Patty Mills can up, like facilitate some of the offense, but you really do not want him doing it a lot. And so when, to, to bring in Curry here to be able to play off Drummond, which we'll talk about here in a second, specifically to play off Drummond because Drummond adds another, this another total little facet to the game that the Nets also have not really had. Um, but Curry specifically was like the reason they frankly won this game because he, yeah. you know, he's able to just provide scoring beyond that, that he can facilitate on his own or off DHOs or like through, you know, running off screens and just can score in a bunch of different ways. And that's just a really, really good thing for this team. They're not going to ask them to do that when they're fully healthy. It's going to be more spot up three point shooting and that's going to be it. But in the short term, when you only have Kyrie half time or less now, because of the schedule, you start to look at you like, Oh, thank goodness. Like they really, yeah. it's so obvious. Like when you saw it, it's like, yeah, they really needed this guy <laughs> like really, really bad. And he was everything you wanted to be in this game. Yeah, and I, I think you mentioned Patty Mills because when you compare their styles of game, obviously Patty's been tremendous for for the Nets, but there's a there's a different dynamic to what Seth Curry can do. And you mentioned the three level scoring, right? He yeah. can he can take a guy off the dribble. He can create space and separation for himself to give opportunities and looks at the basket. And really, in this game, there's a lot of other good performances in it. But when you look down the roster, you do say 
with or without Kyrie Irving, even with, you know, at full strength. Okay, Kyrie Irving and, and Kevin Durant. But but we know, you know, Bruce Brown is not a guy that's going to do that. None of these other guys playing at the three, the four, are going to be able to get into the lane and create for themselves. Or, in a, you know, as a shot clock winds down, find themselves a little bit of separation and get a respectable look. Not a chuck up, not a hey, almost came close on an air ball, you know, Javon Carter look. Like, you, you need these type of quality players that have the confidence and ability to control the tempo of an offense and combine with Patty Mills, you now start to balance out how these rotations look because we had said, again, when you have Kyrie out there, well, you can put Patty Mills next to him in the backcourt or you can go back to where we all thought it was going to begin with him in the second unit and Seth Curry alongside of him. And as you rotate through, you now feel that much more conf- confident in someone that can be on ball, which alleviates the, the, the stress and the pressure that it puts on a Kevin Durant. Again, all, all being healthy in consideration. The other piece around Joe Harris, this is a different dynamic to having a guy who, by the way, was over his last 10 games with Philadelphia shooting 28% from beyond the arc, actually cleaned it up in this one, started one of five, hit down two of his last three in the second half to really put this one away for the Nets. But there's a different level of fluidity that I think he'll bring to this offense. And you already kind of saw that with the pace, the pace of play. We compared this about Kyrie Irving and James Harden. What are they interested in doing? I think Seth Curry more accurately complements what this team would like to do on a consistent possession to possession basis. And you got a sample of it tonight. Yeah. And you get great movement. And then you, we added the, the Andre Drummond piece. Cause like, when you see Andre Drummond, you, you don't like, think, like, well, kid, he's huge. Like Andy just looked, I mean, he looks even bigger now, like, and not like all muscle either. Um, but you know, there. <laughs> you wouldn't think like, Oh, Andre Drummond's going to give your team good spacing. But if you've watched him, and you watch what his game is predicated on. He's like not he's not a post player. He plays real high. And think of how many times they ran like that that two man action where he's the guy into the dribble handoff, right? Like he's the guy that's setting the screen and then just doing like a little baby short roll because he's also a very mm-hmm. good passer. The Nets missed at least four passes of his that were like excellent. He made two cross court to the corner, one to Kessler Edwards that he missed that was like an, a, an elite pass and they just it didn't go yep. in but whatever but like so you th- look at Andre Drummond and you're just like okay this beefy seven footer and you're like well how is he going to add to your spacing well the reason he adds to your spacing because he actually doesn't play plays a, a, a really far away from the basket he's not a threat to shoot but he's so big that you can run screens around him in the moment you can roll multiple actions around him they did it all game long when he played and then if you slip the screen a little bit he's going to find someone in the short roll or he's just going to get all the way to the basket. Is he like elite yeah. elite at this stuff? No, but he's better than anyone else the Nets have on this end of the court. Like in terms of doing that, LaMarcus Aldridge is great in the short, in the mid range. We'll take it all day. Blake is what he is at this point. You know, they've been probably playing with borrowed time on him, but Drummond, you can already see like the, his ability one, cause he's so huge Two, Cause he wants to set screens three that he wants to facilitate some action like that a little further away from the basket. It's just going to help everybody. And you saw it in this game too. It helped Patty Mills. It helped Steph and it helped Bruce Brown, who we'll talk about later because it creates so much space because he's not a lane clogger. Like he's just, he wants to do this other, he wants to, like I said, like sort of like high post, like facilitate action high. And I think, we're just going to get a lot more of that. It really is going to end up complimenting the, the the type of player the Nets have. It complimented who the Sixers had, too, because they had Curry. They had guys like Danny Green, Tyrese Maxey. Like, those guys were able to use what Drummond brings to them. And it was just a great – like, it's great that they – It's 10 minutes into this, you're like, oh, thank God they got him thrown in, too, even though it looked yeah. like it was going to be crowded. And I think we're just going to see, like, less Blake, Blake Griffin and probably maybe, like, less Claxton and stuff. But – yeah, Drummond, the, the combination of these two was really what kind of unlocked a lot of things for the Nets offense. Yeah, and if you like if you like the way Seth Curry and Drummond play together, you can start to think about, well, now get Kyrie out there on the floor, right? Now add Kevin Durant to this mix. And even the other fringe players like Patty Mills we've been talking about, I think there's a lot, there's a trickle-down effect of who benefits off of Andre Drummond being in this role. And specifically to your point, it adds another player into the mix here for Brooklyn the skill set piece where we we'd all prefer that the Nets have one guy that plays at the five that does everything to a certain level and you can run him for 30 minutes. But you mentioned this going back way in the start of the season. 
there's very few, maybe on one hand, you count guys that do it all out of that spot. And they're the guys that are dominant, you know, dominant figures the you know, the jokers of the world. Right. So to have another guy that just fills a need that you have can start to now flesh out, not overtaxing Blake Griffin, maybe reducing what you have expectations around Nicholas Claxton, the spots you want to use him in. So I want to tap back into that a little bit more here. And also uh, the big game, like you said, from Bruce Brown and how this is going to impact other players on the roster. But first, Got to remind your friends that we are well into those New Year's resolutions, and hopefully you didn't bail. I know I didn't. That's because I have Built Bar on my side. We've been talking about them before. Obviously, you go over to Built.com. You check out these 100% covered in real chocolate, delicious protein bars, taste like candy bars, maybe better than candy bars. And not only that, you have to also think about trying out these puffs. I don't know if you have or not, but they are the first ever protein-infused marshmallow. They're fluffy. They're marshmallow e. I make my words if I need to. And they're not just a protein bar. They're a treat. They're delicious. And as I say, 100% real chocolate covered up in there. They're low calorie, high protein. You can place your candy bars with these. They're better. And a typical candy bar is going to have anywhere from two to 300 calories. My God, friends. When you look over at that built bar, you're going to be having yourself a little bit of a 130 calorie, just four grams of sugar, four net carbs, and only not only, and also 17 grams of protein. Mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, all those delicious new flavors with new ones coming out all the time. Got to get over to Built.com and check out all those delicious little snacks because if you don't, they could be gone. Get over to Built.com right now. So before we get into um, the other players on the roster, you meant the one thing you mentioned out of his game that I think is really important to highlight is the passing. Had four assists in this one, probably could have had a few more in it. And again, while we consider LaMarcus Aldrich to be a you know plus passer, there's a fluidity to the way Drummond looks in the offense. And maybe it is pulling, pulling out further from the basket where the spacing starts to look a little bit more natural and comfortable. You have to spread out some of the guys from the paint as well. And then Drummond does have that added, added quickness. So he can both initiate action at the top and then get down and crash on the boards much more effectively than LaMarcus Aldrich can. And has the body and size, though we didn't see Nicholas Claxton in this one, obviously, to be able to body up and still get some gang rebounds. A lot of tips, a lot of action. He had nine rebounds in this. Could have been 10, 12 or so. So I, I do think that but I do think that Andre Drummond, who's only 28 years old, even though I thought he was 38, um, can, can really fill in a much-needed role here. And matchup to matchup, it may look a little bit different, but there is a world where his skill set has the highest value inside of the system the Nets want to run. Yeah, like, like you know, you mentioned all the stuff that we were saying about this, you know, his ability to just sort of not even facilitate offense, but be able to be very comfortable making quick decisions around the top of the key with spacing. Yeah, instinctual. Like you like to see it. Yeah, and then when you get the, and then we, and then I really want to talk about Bruce Brown here in a second. But the, um, and one more thing, because we just didn't mention it, like his defensive impact was really there too. Because the other thing yeah. about like a lot of the Nets guys is that all of them have been, we we talked about the Nets bigs up to this point as all having like being able to do like one or two things well, but nobody can do like everything well. Neither can Drummond, by the way. But what they haven't had is like just size inside, like good, like containable, like pretty smart, low center of gravity, like like just size <laughs> inside. And we really saw that defensive impact today. It was really important against Sabonis in this game, who like had trouble getting to the basket probably as much as he wanted to, and probably would have had this been a different matchup. Like Demonis Sabonis played 26 minutes, was a minus 10, went nine for nine. It's like one of his worst games of the entire year. Um, and I know it's like a lot of that was in Indiana. A big reason for that was there was just not a lot of room to operate. Like when you have Andre Drummond down there and you're trying to get into the post as like a really skilled post player, which Sabonis is like Drummond is just able to just take up a lot of room. He can make up distance yeah. like pretty quickly, which, you know, is funny because when you look at him, you wouldn't think that we saw it a great block of great recovery block by him on Sabonis, which like looked like he had no business getting to and still was able to block it with his off hand. And so I guess I just, I, I we just, only cause we talked so much about the offense. I just want to make sure like the defensive impact was a real thing. Now, was this guy be able to close game seven of a finals? No, like he's just not that kind of guy. Is he mm -hmm. like the exact kind of innings eater that the Nets need right now? Like to just cover like a lot of interior, do things like off like defensive rebound and not get killed in the second chance points, which has been a total disaster for the Nets this season, really over a couple of seasons. Like he does solve those kinds of needs in the now. And that stuff for the regular season is really, really important. So yeah, that's all. I mean, we can talk about Bruce Brown now, but I just wanted to throw up the defensive piece too. 
hundred percent. I also think Sabonis needs to get a haircut. I don't know what that is. It looks like my middle school, you know, photo yearbook. It's just something's got to change, Shots guy. Fired. You're out there. Yeah. Well, listen, come on. You're out there in Sacramento. Let's uh, get with the time. You wouldn't anyway. say it to his face. You wouldn't say it to his face. Uh, well, well, I'd say it to like his crotch because I'm not nearly the same height as him. <laughs> but the bottom go. line is I'd still be with forceful <laughs> words. Bruce Brown, on the other hand, around the trade, everyone said, right, you know, uh, Bembry ended up being a casualty, had to make the roster room here. Uh, heard in spaces over on Twitter, a lot of Nets fans upset about that. And while I understood, and this was not, <laughs> I'm not taking a victory lap on it, that it hurt to lose a player like Bembry, and some people point to James Johnson or Bruce Brown, saying Bruce Brown has struggled. You know what are we doing with him? Making four point seven? No, can veto the trade? Got to find a way to get rid of him. I, I do think that after this trade again, he's a great candidate for who ends up benefiting from having players like this around him. He gets to get back what to, to what he does really well, and I think the tie into a guy like Drummond and to Curry is. He can find space and get in around the basket and get some of those easy finishes because we know he plays well above his size. Yeah, that's what we saw. Like when when the interior is cleared out of the post because Drummond is operating further away, you're just going to get more back cutting. I mean, they all they they got into into transition a decent amount, but he's just able to get to the basket a little easier as part of that game. And when you have someone that can find you in that space. They can like sort of see over defenses or that you can just know that you can operate a little more cleanly around the basket where it's not going to be packed in, which it has been like the interior has been so packed in because the Nets are down shooters. They don't have enough shooters. So like teams could already just pack the paint against them in a way that's going to make Bruce Brown's game just totally impossible. And so between that, like, and then just like eight defensive stats, which is just ridiculous, um, like just all over defensively. And that more, and that to me speaks a little bit more just to the energy piece, you know, eight, eight eight defensive stats in a game. Like we know Bruce Brown's a very, very good defender, but when you Mm -hmm. pile it up like that, it usually to me, one, it's a little bit of luck, but two, it's a lot of just like, yeah, you're playing with so much energy because a lot of times that stuff is just energy wise, right? Like it's just stuff that you get because you're flying all over the court because you want to be there. You're having fun and you know, you're taking some gambles, but you're just feeling like things are going your way. And so when you combine those things together, we just saw, I mean, easily his best game is a net, right? Like 19 points, six boards, six assists, five steals, three blocks. So he'll never have a better statistical game. A hundred percent. I'll make, I'll bet my entire life on that. Um, but it more speaks to sort of like what can happen with a specifically a guy in his role when the makeup of the team just looks a little different, right? Yep. Like when, like when the makeup of like how they're running things, both on the defensive end and on the offensive end just looks a little bit different, allows for a little more chaos, right? Like a little bit more, just like constant, more movement on the offensive end from this team because just running off more screens like you're going to get paid off by by continuing to move around the perimeter and that's what happened and bruce brown was just the perfect example of it and i really thought too you know because again we're gonna we're gonna see this at, at when durant gets back when irving's on the court with them but you know, even the impact of i'll say curry and drummond again and extends to Bruce. by the way like bruce brown can give you a 38 minute performance not going to give it to you every single night, but he can fill in for one of these. All the other starters, 32, 32, 24 for Drummond, 25 for Edwards. But then when you tap into the bench, well, now Aldrich's 19 minutes can be that much more effective where he, yep. again, does the mid-range automatic 8 of 11, right? Like there's that that's a, a secondary piece of this, of, of, of the lift that it takes off a guy like Aldrich, who throughout the start of this season, we were saying, well, he's the only offensive big you have, so you kind of need him to be productive and be productive with consistency. And every time that he went down with an injury or had to miss some games, you saw the impact that it had. All of a sudden, the offense got very stagnated. All of a sudden, you know, Nicholas Claxton wasn't going to be able to do anything effectively on that end of the floor outside of rebounding and pseudo setting some screens. It's why you try to use a guy like Dayron Sharp and see what you can get out of him, or went small and really started leaning to heavy minutes for guys like James Johnson and Blake Griffin. So, you, I think we'll start to see here, even without having Kyrie for these home games, and it seems like there's some positive indications around that as well, if you're looking at some other cities around the country, um, that the minute share should start to balance out here with the addition of these two players as well. And if you can reduce the fatigue factor on some guys and start to shift players back into the roles that they're that they're expected to fill, all of a sudden, it, 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 it borderline does, night and day, look like, oh, well, we're a fairly balanced roster all of a sudden where everything leading up to this was 
geez, I don't know. Do we have enough pieces and parts around them? Do we have enough scoring? And it's weird to look at it and have that type of sentiment out of one game against the Kings after you trade away James Harden. But it does look like that's the way this can trend. And obviously, we haven't even started to introduce the idea of where does Ben Simmons fit into this as he gets onto the court and how will that further impact what the Nets are going to be able to do? Because in Drummond, Curry, and Simmons, you're adding, I think, three competent players in almost all phases of the game in, in all different roles, right? At every different level, a big, a facilitator, a stretch, like all these different roles now get that much more improved across the roster. And everyone else slides into a depth role now. I mean, the Nets arguably are, are they're, they're plugging in three starters to their rotation now through this trade. Yeah, that's what they did. And that's what, look, and I, I'm, I'm totally with you. We're like, we're not overrating a game against the Kings. No, no, no. It's like the win that defines their season. It's more now that. Now go do it again, yeah. by the way. Now, now go do it again and confirm that this can be a part of the success, right? It's more like, it's more like saying, hey, they finally won a game and it wasn't by accident. Like this wasn't, they didn't yeah. just like luck box their way. They didn't luck box their way into a win <laughs> against the Kings. That's a good, like, that is a good was, way to put it. This was a real win that like you can take real takeaways from this and start to see how it's going to shape out over the rest of the season. It's not going to be like they're not going to win every single game from here on in, but this was not like, hey, they shot 60% from three and they won. No, that's not what happened. Like they, We can take real fundamental things that happen in this game and see how they're going to start translating out when the team gets healthier. And I think that's more than anything uh, the big takeaway from this game. Okay, we're gonna we'll talk a little bit more. I, I want to talk a little more Cam Thomas, how he performed this one. Uh, little Patty Mills, I think, because just how the, the load was lightened off him a little bit. Finally got Kessler Edwards maybe going. I mean, he's still kind of struggling with three, but I think there were some positive takeaways there as well. We'll talk about all that stuff tomorrow. In the meantime, go over to YouTube. Hey, you already missed the thousand uh, thousand uh, subscriber thing. We blew past that over over last week, um, and so but still time to go over and subscribe. Uh, we had our best week ever over on YouTube. Had our best week ever in the podcast right now. Come week. on, guys. 10, yeah, 10 now, away from 1100. Be a part of that. You can, there's there always you something I'll drop. to be a part of. <laughs> and, I'll, and let's just say, too, as we get out of here, just a big thank you to everyone. Last week was a massive week uh, for us on the podcast. Like I said, biggest week in terms of downloads. Uh, blew by all of our goals for YouTube uh, in the short term. So now we just have new goals for YouTube. Uh, and that's all because everyone that's just jumped in and listened and commented and, and subscribed. And we really, really appreciate it. Go join in with what everyone else is doing by subscribing over on YouTube. I'll put the link in the show notes. The Brooklyn Nets have started anew, my friends. They should, uh, they should think about calling us the Febreze brothers because we're feeling so fresh. Alan Gamble. Oh, the all-time great poets. We'll be back again tomorrow talking more Brooklyn Nets basketball.